Luke chapter 18, starting at verse 9. This is the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector, sometimes called publican. Now, we need to uh, we need to try to put out of our minds for a moment the things that we've learned uh, concerning Pharisees. Because when you think Pharisee, you think what? What what immediately pops into your mind? Bad. Bad. Yeah. Yeah. Hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. Bad dudes. Hypocrisy. Uh, what I would like to suggest to you uh, is that if you were in the original audience uh, of, uh, of Jesus here, that would not be what is in your mind. You've been trained to think that way, and I'm not saying that that's wrong, uh, because you, you've read the Gospels and you've seen what Jesus has to say uh, to and about uh, the Pharisees. But if you were in the audience, uh, or you were just a, a general sort of Jewish onlooker, I submit that you would not feel this way. You would not feel negatively uh, towards uh, the Pharisees. And one place to really see how this is demonstrated is at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, where Jesus says, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you'll by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. What Jesus is there doing is he's setting uh, an impossibly high bar for your righteousness, and he's using Pharisee as an example of external righteousness or apparent righteousness, somebody that appears to be an exceptional human being, but what is more, an exceptional human being in the sight of God. So a Pharisee is somebody who has a rigorous devotion to, uh, to the practice of the law, to the practice of the word of God. So you would not think of it negatively, but rather positively. That's why this parable would have been so striking. Uh, likewise, you know, tax collectors, I, well, we've all learned through sermons and Bible classes and so forth that tax collectors were cheats. I don't think we can really grasp just how much such a person would have been hated, would have been despised. Uh, so we, we've been trained to think of the tax collectors as, as actually good guys because they're generally uh, presented as people who come around and they're, uh, they end up on Team Jesus. And Pharisees, those are the bad guys. They don't come around. They're, uh, they're the allies of Satan. But it would be precisely the opposite would be our impressions if we encountered these people in action. Uh, so uh, this uh, Luke colors the story for us uh, with, uh, with verse 9, uh, with verse 9 Luke chapter 18, uh, verse 9. Uh, Jesus spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. So the parable is going to be about uh, about two different things, or right? two main concepts to grasp to understand the parable. The first one is trust, and the second is righteousness. Now, it doesn't come out very clearly uh, in uh, in English uh, because we use uh, we use different words for it. For this. Oh, alas, we have no markers. Um, would you think that would be fantastic? Uh, so let's uh, let's hold off then just for a minute on the uh, uh, the word group for uh, for just and righteous, and let's just take a look at the parable uh, itself. So uh, let's read the thing out. Uh, Roberta, do you want to read that for me? Verses sure. nine through fourteen, Luke chapter eighteen. Okay. Also, he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the tax collector, standing afar off, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, 
but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified, rather than the other. For everyone who exalts, exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Okay, so what's the context? The, uh, the place? Temple. The temple. Uh, so, we have to ask ourselves why there. Context is the temple. And the main teaching seems to, the main concern seems to be what? According to, uh, uh, according to, we have that concluding saying uh, that, uh, that is present in many uh, passages uh, of, the, of the Gospels, uh, common saying of Jesus. Uh, and you can see uh, similarities to other ones. You know, the, the one who humbles himself will be exalted. The one who exalts himself will be humbled. The one who is first will be last. The one who is last will be first. This idea of a reversal, a throwing down of the high and a lifting up of the low. Uh, but uh, but Jesus is uh, Jesus wants to tell us uh, the distinction between the final state of the two men. So what is what is that distinction? Not their attitude, but the, but what's the what would be the goal? The tax collector departs from the temple with what? Justification. Justification. So that's our that's our chief topic here. Now this is one of the very few places that we find. Uh, that we find the verb uh, uh, to be justified uh, in the Gospels. You can find that verb being used quite a bit in the writings, especially of St. Paul, also the other uh, letters of the New Testament, uh, but particularly St. Paul. This is a major focus of his teaching. Some would uh, separate the teachings of Paul from the teachings of Jesus. This is a very common uh, theological idea that we have the kind of the pure teachings of Jesus, and then you get Paul, who's kind of obsessed with some other things, and we try to create a wedge uh, between the Gospels and Paul, and that Paul has invented a kind of religion based upon the idea of Jesus, but not really based upon the teachings themselves of Jesus. This is the wedge that people try to draw. Well, what I think is very helpful uh, is to recognize that while the verb justify, to justify, the tax collector went, uh, went down or went home justified, uh, while that <coughs> verb is rare in the Gospels, the noun and the concept is extremely prevalent. Hello, welcome, come on in, fun to see you. There are friendly people around here. Uh, and a few not so friendly people, but we let them stay too. I'm thinking of you, Dolores Marine. That's <laughs> teasing. Uh, so here's where it's uh, it's helpful uh, just to uh, just to see uh, how this how this plays out. Um, you're gonna have to forgive me, Leo, but you're gonna learn a little Greek this morning. Um, so we have Dikaios, and then we have. Um, Dikai Ako. Oops, see that's some sort of weird hybrid thing that I just did there. Dikai Ako. That's a um, this is a verb. Um, and then we have another one other term related. Dikai Sune. So you see how those see how these are all uh, uh, related. Uh, in their uh, in their uh, beginnings, their root. So uh, here we get the idea then of just or righteous, and this is then um, <coughs> to justify, uh, and then this is justification. Now the real problem, uh, the, the real challenge that we have to sort out is that we're going to see 
this term a lot uh, in the Gospels and in other uh, pots of, uh, spots of the New Testament, righteous. And so what doesn't make, what doesn't happen in our mind is this connection between the term righteous or righteousness and justify or justification. So what we have to wrap around, uh, wrap our minds around uh, when reading the Gospels is that when St. Paul talks about justification or being justified and Jesus talks about righteousness, they're talking about the same thing. It's the same topic. So we don't get some new teaching in the, uh, in the writings of Paul on justification that isn't found or present in the teachings of Jesus. Make sense so far? So with that in mind then, uh, looking at, the, uh, looking at uh, just the parable that we just read, uh, you can see uh, in the introduction, uh, verse 9, uh, that uh, some trusted in themselves that they were righteous, Okay, dikaioi is how it is. And then we get uh, the, the departure uh, in verse uh, 14. I tell you, this man went down to his house, dikaiomenos is how it comes out. So do you hear that? It's the same word, in other words. So righteousness, justification, same word, same idea, same concept. So now we have to ask ourselves, uh, what, uh, what is righteousness uh, in the Gospels? And we'll do that right after we just look at the content of the, uh, of the petitions that, uh, that are being prayed. Now, we've been prejudiced against this poor Pharisee uh, because, uh, because of the setup. Ah, this guy trusts in himself, he despises others, bad guy, we don't like him. Uh, but the Pharisee is exactly the person that we want as a member of our church. Why? Why would we want the Pharisee, not only maybe as a member of our church, but we would want to make him, uh, like we would want to put him on the board of deacons or elders. We would want him uh, to, uh, to perhaps be invested somehow financially in the church, make him the treasurer, make him the congregational president. We want him on the council. Why? Why do we want this guy in our church? He's an upstanding member of the community. He's an upstanding member of the community, and what else does he do? He sets a good example. He sets a good example. Uh, he gives money. Yeah. We want this guy. We love this guy. He's fantastic. He gives a bunch of his of his money, uh, and and the truth is, we need it, and we're uh, seeking to do uh, good things with it. Uh, and if you look at, I mean, we can read his prayer with a sneer, but uh, is there a is there almost a charitable way you can read his prayer? I thank you that I'm not that I'm not like other people. And is he, is he thanking himself? He's thanking he's thanking God. I am I have not gotten wrapped up in murder and adultery and drug abuse and embezzlement. I I'm so thankful to God that he has uh, that he has enabled me to live uh, a life of faith and piety. What a beautiful thing. I mean, isn't, that, isn't there a, a sort of variant of that prayer that, that you could pray? You know, say, you know, coming to communion, isn't that wonderful that, uh, that God loves me and that God has blessed me so richly uh, and that I don't have these terrible pangs of conscience about my, uh, my awful way of living? I, I think there's almost a, a kind of charitable, uh, charitable reading that we could have about this. Now, with the tax collector, uh, is it possible to... Uh, to read his prayer in a very uncharitable kind of way. What does he seem to want? Mercy. He wants mercy. And do we think he ought to get it? He probably didn't show mercy to other people when he was collecting the taxes. No. Maybe we would want him to sit and stew for a while. We're going to have to investigate this character before we let him into the church. Uh, certainly before we put him on the church council. You're going to give him charge of the books? This is the last guy you're going to want there. 
Yeah, watch it, Roberta. <laughs> right. Yeah, Paul. When I was a kid, I got uh, my parents read the Arch books, and uh, the Arch book of the in the Temple. I, I thought when I was a kid, I thought that I thought that the Pharisee was the good guy, and the, the tax collector was the bad guy. Well, then he, that's exactly yeah, right. That, that was a good yeah. impression of the guy. And I'm, I'm, another question: What exactly? I thought, frankly, I thought a Pharisee was an employee of the Temple. I thought that he. What did, what did he do? Where did he get his wealth from? Was, was he was learned? He was able to read and write, and, and uh, he collected. Well, it's it's not, uh, don't think of it as an occupation. Uh, think of it as being a member of a club, okay. or more like that, a member of a society. Okay. Uh, okay. So okay. these are not, uh, these are not <laughs> temple employees. In fact, uh, they often, uh, while, while they did what Jews do, uh, which is go to go to temple, offer sacrifices, and so forth. Uh, they're not; these are not priests, and they often are thought of as being uh, opposed to uh, to the priests and the priestly class. And there was even uh, there was there was the rampant position uh, among uh, people in Judaism at this time that, in fact, the temple leadership was corrupt and maybe even illegitimate. Uh, so this is the argument, uh, for example, that uh, the teacher Bonhoeffer was trying to uh, raise in the, the early parts, uh, the, the formation of the Confessing Church uh, in, in Germany, uh, over, uh, over against the, the Reich Church, the German Church, the German Christians. Uh, Bonhoeffer wanted the world to recognize uh, the, the Confessing Christians, the Confessing Church in Germany, as the true church. And in fact, uh, the, the official church, or the state church, as being no church at all, as having lost their foundations. Now, I, I set forth that example for you because there were uh, communities, most notably the Essenes, or the, uh, the, the people where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, uh, that, uh, that saw the, the entire temple as being illegitimate. And so they had set up their own community, and they were waiting for uh, the restoration of uh, the Messiah would restore then proper worship uh, and uh, proper uh, the proper functioning of how Judaism was uh, was supposed to run or be. So they uh, some of these some of these people actually thought of the, the temple as not. They weren't against sacrifices or temple service, but the people in charge are not are not legitimate. That the whole thing has come under a uh, scam and corruption and so forth. So, uh, so no, not the party of the uh, not the party of the temple uh, or the, the party of worshipers. So, uh, so he wants uh, he wants mercy. Uh, but what what aren't we told about the tax collector that we might want to? know about him or see in him. Is he repentant? Is he really repentant? I mean, he certainly seems contrite. Contrition has to do with the sorrow over sin. Uh, but, uh, but the idea of repentance adds what, would you say, Don? Desire for change. Desire for change, precisely. The word that we render as repent you have this stuff in your mind here, dikaios, uh, just righteous, dikaiacho, uh, to justify, either to make righteous or to declare righteous, sometimes then to explain the idea then, uh, to give a justification for your action, and then dikaiosune, justification. Now, um, While the word repent is not used here, you are exactly right, Don. Um, we would want to see in this guy some sort of repentance, and uh, this word re uh, repent, the, the English uh, verb repent, in Hebrew it's shuv, and it means to turn, and then, anybody remember the, uh, the Greek word? Metanoia. Metanoia. And metanoia is the, uh, the noun for repentance. Meta, uh, is it metanoia or eto? I think it's, I think it's eto. Yeah. So, and here with meta is change. And the noia comes from use. 
mind. So, to, I think to understand our word repent or repentance, you need to get both of these, the Hebrew concept and the Greek uh, translation in your mind and, and put them together. That's what repentance is. It's to, to turn around and to change your mind. Uh, and by changing your mind and by turning around, you're going to change your walk, your path, your life. So repentance isn't just saying, I'm sorry. Repentance is also not doing it again. Uh, I'm going to use that line in my sermon, but I've been reading a book by Spangenberg uh, called, uh, it's just been translated into English, uh, it's called The Christian Year of Grace, and it's devotions on, on uh, the texts of the church year. Um, and uh, so I don't know where this comes from, but, uh, but he quotes it as, as like a popular saying. As everybody knows, as is often said, he will say, the highest form of repentance is to not do it again. Uh, so that's what we would want to see before we would really let this tax collector vote, before we would let this tax collector sit on the church council, before we may, maybe before we would even let him pass the offering plate, because what has this guy made a life of doing? Getting his hand into the till. Uh, so we would be very suspicious of this guy, and his prayer, uh, asking for God's mercy, would be, oh gosh, we're going to want to see a little bit more before, before we can really uh, count upon this. That's why the, uh, the shock uh, of Jesus saying uh, really needs to be emphasized for us. When Jesus says that the tax collector goes home justified, it's exactly the opposite uh, outcome that, that anybody looking at these two people would have expected. They would have expected the Pharisee to go home justified, and the tax collector, well, maybe he's made a decent beginning, but that guy, if anybody's going to be in hell, if we had to pick, it's going to be that guy. So, uh, so that's, the, that's the mindset uh, that we have here. And now, uh, having, uh, having talked about uh, a little Greek here, what would you expect? This is going to be a word that you already know, or that you think you know at least. Uh, what would you expect the Greek to be behind uh, the tax collector's prayer, uh, God be merciful to me a sin? The word for mercy there, the word that is put into English as mercy or be merciful, what would you expect that to be in Greek? A liaison. That's what we would expect. A liaison. Kyrie eleison. Foundational part of the liturgy. That prayer, a liaison to God, uh, is found throughout the Bible. This is the prayer of the Christian. Kyrie eleison, O Lord, have mercy. And wrapped up in the idea of mercy is not just forgiveness, but it also has to do with uh, help uh, in need. It's, uh, it's related to the term for alms, for charity that would be given. So we are asking God for alms. We are, as beggars, uh, wishing that God would give us uh, a meal ticket. Uh, a, a Safeway card so that we could go get a little food. Uh, that's the that's the heart of this idea then of uh, mercy. Show pity on me. Help me in my distress. Uh, and so, like I said, this is a term that people are familiar with, a liaison. Uh, but it is shocking then, uh, having made this assumption, because almost every place, if you're reading through the English Bible, Almost every time, if you were to start then with the word mercy and go look at the Greek, that's what you would find. And so it's astonishing when you open up and find out that's not the word that's being used. Uh, and the word that uh, is being used, helaskamas, uh, is, uh, is related particularly to uh, the mercy seat, what, uh, uh, what Luther rendered the Gnadenstuhl. Uh, the, uh, the grace stool. Uh, and what is the mercy seat in uh, Old Testament uh, liturgical theology or understanding? The cover of the ark. The cover of the ark. So you, you know those passages in the Bible where it says God is enthroned between the cherubim? Are you familiar with that? Uh, it's a number of places in the Old Testament. God is enthroned between the cherubim. That's not a concept. That's not just you know imagining. I bet God's up in heaven and angels are around. Uh, but it's referring to the Ark of the Covenant. On, uh, on each end would be uh, an angel, uh, a cherub, 
not your little uh, chubby guy shooting a, shooting a heart, a little you know, three-year-old kid with a big uh, rotund belly, uh, but uh, there between the angels is God. Now what happens, uh, liturgically speaking, at the Ark of the Covenant? Is it, is it a regular daily focus of worship for the Jews? No. The Ark of the Covenant? No. I mean, they would, uh, it would be in the sense that they know that it's there inside not just the holy place, but the holiest place, the Holy of Holies. They know that it's there, but, uh, but do the people see it? No. Do the priests see it? Only the high priest, and that but once a year. And, and he doesn't go into the most holy place without what? Blood. <laughs> the blood of the sacrifice, yes. So the high priest goes in once a year uh, with the blood uh, in the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. Uh, Kippur atonement, uh, kapar, means to cover. You know the passage in the Bible where it says, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven and whose sin is covered. This is what God does with our sin. He covers them up so that they cannot be seen. Not in the sense of a, uh, a cover-up where if uh, the, the CIA has you know, done something bad that you know, might want to hide it. No reference to your job. But um, any of you, with your, uh, with your nefarious dealings with the government, but uh, God is going to cover it up and it's going to stay covered. No one is going to see what is happening. It's all covered over. So, uh, the, uh, the word then for, uh, that, that is being used for, or uh, translated as mercy, has to do then with the Ark of the Covenant, but also then the more general topic of uh, sacrificial offerings. And that's going on every day in the temple. Every evening, every morning, there is a lamb for sacrifice, on top of which would also be placed other, uh, other offerings that people would come and bring. Sin offerings, uh, offerings of peace, which would, uh, which would not be particularly like I'm coming to confess my sins, but rather I'm coming to receive the peace of God in the temple, and this would involve a uh, ritual or a sacrificial meal uh, that would take place. The priests are eating some of it, uh, the family that uh, brings the offering is bringing some of it, and other sorts of occasional offerings that would uh, take place, as are outlined you know, particularly in the, uh, in the book of uh, Leviticus and Numbers. Uh, and, uh, and the end of Exodus too. Uh, so when the, uh, when the publican, the tax collector says, God be merciful to me a sinner, uh, we could really say, uh, God, do the thing you do at the altar for me. That's really, that, I mean, that's a, that's a very cumbersome way of translating it. So you wouldn't really want to put that, but uh, God, you know that thing that's happening at the altar right now? where you are uh, making peace with your people and pardoning sins, I want that to be for me. So imagine yourself standing, <coughs> up, standing upstairs in the church, contemplating your many sins, your great sins, uh, and, and you say, Lord Jesus Christ, I want, the body, uh, I want your body and blood that you dish out in this sacrament to be for me, for my forgiveness and for my healing. That's the uh, that's the, the idea that's being rendered here when the when the tax collector says, uh, "God, be merciful to me, a sinner." Not just forgive my sins, but do the thing you do here in the temple for me. So he is fixated upon the altar. He's fixated upon the sacrifice, and it's really important that we not understand the sacrificial rituals of the temple as human offerings to appease God, but rather as uh, Old Testament means of grace, ways in which God provided access of himself to his people, ways in which he made it possible for them to be restored, cleansed, forgiven, brought into his presence, and then anticipating uh, the life of the kingdom which is to come. So, uh, so that's how we need to think of his, uh, of his prayer for mercy here, as not just, please forgive my sins, but do the thing you do at the altar. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, let's look at how this term plays itself out in the New Testament. Not, not the one about have mercy, but uh, back to the idea of justice, justification.
Article 4 of the Augsburg Confession is the heart of the, uh, the heart of the Confession. I, I didn't keep one for myself. Is there an extra? Uh, thanks. Um, Article 4 uh, of the Augsburg Confession is the heart of our Confession. I'm not sure that when the Augsburg Confession was being prepared, uh, and it was presented when? The Augsburg Confession? 1533. the right century, good. 30, and what was the date? June 25th, June 25th, 1530. That was also my grandmother's birthday. June 25th, 1530. And the... Uh, old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not the year, just the day. Uh, <laughs> She was an extraordinary woman. Is that June 25th old style or new style? New, yeah. Uh, so uh, it was then in uh, the same date, 1580, that the Book of Concord was sort of officially uh, adopted or ratified. Um, so I'm not sure that they fully realized that this would actually be the issue. Uh, in the in the Reformation uh, at this time, a lot of the things uh, that seemed to be the big issues ended up actually just being peripheral issues around this central issue. So the question of indulgences, the question of the purpose of the mass, the question of uh, monasticism and celibacy, the question of mandated fasts, the distinction of means, etc. Uh, the abuses that are outlined, or the corrections and reforms that have been made uh, in the latter portion of the Augsburg Confession, all end up actually revolving around this article, Article 4, which the Church uh, referred to then as the article by which the Church stands or falls. The article by which the Church stands or falls. The, uh, and that sound right there is what happens when you pull out justification. Uh, there is a collapse. Uh, everything else is going to fall apart. So uh, let's, just, uh, let's just read the text here. Also they, uh, and that is um, uh, our churches. Uh, now they do not think of themselves as being a separate denomination, a separate church, or anything like this. Uh, but uh, this is one part of the church speaking to another part of the church, or really speaking to the emperor, about the changes that have been made. And this, uh, the entire first section was intended to set forth, see, we are perfectly orthodox in our, uh, in our teaching and in our faith. We teach the classical Christian teachings. So they, our churches, teach that men cannot be justified, declared righteous, before God by their own strength, merits, or works, but are freely justified for Christ's sake through faith, when they believe that they are received into favor and that their sins are forgiven for Christ's sake, who by his death has made satisfaction for our sins. This faith God imputes for righteousness in his sight. See Romans 3 and 4. This then becomes the heart. So what's astonishing uh, at the first reading is if you then open up to the apology to the Augsburg Confession, which is its explanation, uh, you see Article 4, it goes on and on and on and on for tens and tens and tens and tens more pages on just this article. Uh, because this ends up being the real issue. How are we received into uh, favor before God. Is it our working or is it Christ's working and the bestowal then of his gift? So uh, so that's how justification plays out uh, in this, you know, historically in the Christian context. But as I mentioned before, its root uh, is going to be used throughout uh, also the Gospels, uh, not just uh, in this uh, in this place. So let's, let's see how, this is a selection, this is not comprehensive. Uh, uh, Let's see how the term uh, plays out in various places in the New Testament. Uh, go to uh, Matthew chapter 1, verse 19. Matthew 
and uh, D. Could you please uh, read that read that passage for me? That Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, is minded to put her away secretly. Okay, being a just man, did chaos. Uh, so what would that uh, what do you what would that mean? How would you paraphrase that uh, if if you needed to explain what it means that Joseph is a just man, and we see here that his justice is being invoked as an explanation for his action towards Mary. He's not going to uh, put her to shame or make a scandal because she's pregnant, and he knows the baby's not his. So what uh, what, what does it mean in this context? Compassion. He's a compassionate man. Um, Righteous. Anything else? Think simple. If you were, what was that, Paul? Good. Good. Yeah. I mean, have you ever been at the funeral home and said about another person, "He was a good man," or "She was a good man"? Uh, and of course, as Lutherans, then we feel this necessity. Well, of course, he was a sinner. Um, uh, but when we say that he was a good man, uh, what do we really? I mean, is it possible to say that and, at this, and, and really mean it and have it be a genuine, true statement along with holding to uh, the Christian teaching that everybody's a sinner, that nobody's good? What do we really mean by good man? Then? What sort of person would you call a good man? A good woman, a good person? Honest. Kind? Honest. Honest. What else? Ethical. Ethical. Somebody that paid their taxes, didn't cheat other people, didn't run other people down, was nice, uh, did their work fairly, honestly, was hardworking, loved his wife, loved his kids, all these sorts of things. Followed the rules. Followed the rules. Yeah, yeah, precisely. Now, is it possible uh, for, for us to say that even about a non-Christian person? Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. And we call all of this civil righteousness. There is a kind of righteousness before men. Uh, that, uh, that is very possible uh, to attain. And so we can look at a person and we can say, I've sometimes said this about, my, uh, about you know, various Christians, I know that person is a sinner, but I've never seen it. I've never seen it. They've always just been the epitome of, uh, of, of good, kind behavior, exactly what you would expect. Uh, so, uh, so that's one kind of usage that you will find. And I think that's, uh, that's what's in mind here. Joseph is a good guy. He's a nice guy. He's not going to want to cause trouble. He's just going to deal with this uh, with this problem as uh, as best he can. All right. Uh, now let's go to uh, same book, Matthew chapter three, verse fifteen. Uh, Greg, do you know the thing? What's the reference? Three fifteen. Matthew three fifteen. But Jesus answered and said to them. Permitted to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed. Him. All right. This is John the Baptist. Jesus has come to John the Baptist. John the Baptist doesn't want uh, to baptize Jesus because baptism is for sinners. sinners. Baptism is for sinners, and I'm not baptizing you. You should be baptizing me. Uh, this doesn't make any sense. But Jesus says that his that this action. Uh, is going to be part of this whole package of the fulfilling of righteousness. So this is what Jesus does. He has come to fulfill righteousness. He is going to be righteous, not just in the Joseph sense, not just in his adopted father's sense, but rather uh, this is a kind of uh, righteousness before God. So Jesus goes into the waters and identifies with sinners. The sinless one identifies with sinners all as part of his path of fulfilling everything that it means to be truly righteous before God. Now go uh, two more chapters, Matthew chapter 5. Uh, and, uh, and we want to look at verse 6. Sherry, do you know that? Matthew 5, verse 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Okay, now throughout the Beatitudes, this is the, the Sermon on the Mount, uh, is this idea of those who lack. So there are the, the poor, the poor in spirit, uh, the meek, 
uh, the people who are persecuted, uh, and in this case, those who are hungering and thirsting for righteousness. Now, if you hunger for something, it means you don't have it already. So this hunger and thirst for righteousness uh, is not the kind of civil righteousness, but rather a divine righteousness, a higher righteousness. Now go to chapter, uh, same chapter, Matthew chapter 5, verse 10, and uh, let's look at what it says uh, there. Uh, Mark, would you read that for me? Mark, which one? 510. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness and say, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now read verse 11. Blessed are those, blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. All right. So we have to put these two together. We have persecuted for the sake of righteousness. And then uh, in verse 11, Jesus applies it specifically to his disciples. Uh, Blessed are you when they persecute you. Why? Because you're such decent people? Because you're with me. Yeah. So you're persecuted uh, on account of Jesus. So what is righteousness? You see how we're setting the stage here? Matthew is setting, up, setting us up. For, uh, for what righteousness really is. It's not just the righteousness of Joseph, and that's not in any way to put down Joseph whatsoever, uh, but rather there is a higher kind of righteousness that is to be found. Now, uh, the passage that I already mentioned, uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 20, uh, For I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that righteousness of that the scribes and Pharisees have, you're not getting into heaven, which means you're going to hell. The conclusion of that chapter says you must be perfect, as your Father in heaven is perfect. So the righteousness that is the higher righteousness is a righteousness of perfection, and you don't have it. And the, the entirety of chapter 5 is intended to point out your lack. You think you kept the fifth commandment, you shall not murder? Well, guess what? If you've ever had... For a, a fleeting moment, a negative thought about the person that cut you off in traffic, you're a murderer. You think you've been faithful to your wife? If you've ever once been watching a football game and glanced at a cheerleader uh, with any sort of uh, amorous thought in your mind, uh, boom, you've broken the sixth commandment. You're done. So uh, there is a righteousness that you can't get. Uh, now, what I think is really interesting, did I include it on here? Um, no, I didn't on your, uh, on your passage, uh, on, your, on the sheet there, but in Matthew chapter 5, verse 25, uh, agree with your adversary quickly. And uh, the word uh, adversary there, remember we talked about the um, uh, uh, dikos, dikaios, being uh, righteousness? This is anti dico your adversary is the one who goes into court to point out your lack of righteousness. You are, you are wrong before the court. We're going to try to convince the judge that my position is right and your position is wrong. So the adversary is against your righteousness, the one who is going to prosecute you and point out, uh, point out your fault. So, And that's what Satan does with us. He is our adversary. He says, Holly is not righteous. That's what Satan does. And our Lord Jesus Christ then, and also the Holy Spirit, is described for us as an advocate, the one who stands up and says, in fact, Holly's payment before the court has been settled. All matters are settled. She is justified, she is righteous, she is free to go on account of uh, the work of Jesus on the cross. So we have an adversary pointing out your lack of righteousness, and then you have an advocate, one who speaks on your behalf and says, no, in fact, this person is righteous, free to go. So that's this idea then of, uh, of righteousness uh, that, is, uh, that is playing out uh, in, the, um, uh, in the Gospels. Um, so uh, Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. This is the last one that we'll have time for uh, today. You can't understand this verse isolated from its context. The context of the Sermon on the Mount that... Um, that there is among the, the followers of Jesus a hungering and thirsting for righteousness, which he does not yet have, there is a, uh, there is a demand for a higher righteousness, a perfect righteousness, 
And then we get here, this beautiful statement of Jesus, right after he has said, don't worry about all the material stuff. Don't worry about your possessions and where you're going to get clothes and where you're going to get food and how your mortgage is going to be paid. God will take care of you. Here's what you should be worried about, uh, which is to say concerned about. Uh, this should be the one thing that you're really after. Matthew 6, verse 33. Uh, who's got that for me? Uh, Paul, would you read that for me? Uh, Paul, our cat, Matthew 6, 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Okay. Now, whose righteousness? Uh, God's, not your own. So we are looking for a righteousness, not the kind of righteousness that Joseph had. Although, we should strive for that as well, to be nice, decent people. That's, I'm not saying that's not important. It is important. It's a good thing. In fact, it may very well be a fruit and a demonstration of the righteousness that one receives. But the righteousness that you need before God is not the righteousness of a decent person who obeys the speed limit, doesn't get pulled over for having a tail light out, and doesn't, no reference to anybody here. Um, the, uh, um, you know, I was thinking last night. Ruth Ring uh, was saying, "I can't hear a word you say in sermons," or, and she was, uh, and in conversation as well, because she has difficulty hearing. And it suddenly occurred to me that it doesn't really even matter what I preach. She reads your lips. She's going to read my lips. Yeah, she reads the actual text. We send it to her later on. So I guess it does matter. But I say, well, at least Ruth won't say bad sermon, Pastor. You know? <laughs> she won't know. It'll be great. Uh, the righteousness that we need is not ours, but it's the one that God is going to. So when St. Paul says that we are justified by faith in Christ Jesus, this is nothing other than the entire teaching of Jesus about justice and righteousness. Jesus reveals to us the law. There is no righteousness in you that avails before God. Ask God for, the, for his righteousness, and he'll give it to you. He gives it to you. So there's a hunger and thirst for righteousness, and they shall be filled. Be filled in the sense of an infant or a toddler who cannot obtain food for himself, but it just rains down and is bestowed freely uh, without any merit or worthiness in us. So, uh, so that's why the tax collector goes home justified, because he seeks not a righteousness in himself, but he seeks the righteousness that is on the altar. There's where he finds righteousness. There's where he finds mercy. There's where he finds justification. And the very same thing is what we do when we go to church. It's not as though, well, we don't have the temple anymore, we don't have the sacrifices. That's just, this is exactly what we should do. And if you want to go home righteous today, then you go upstairs and you say as you approach the altar, God, do the thing you do at the altar and give it to me because I desperately need it. I hunger and thirst for a righteousness outside of myself that only you can give me. And then I would also advise, go home and be like Joseph. Be a decent person. But don't think that your uh, just life is what, uh, is what avails before God. It should rather than be thought of as, this is how I now live, uh, because it's, it's who I am. I am just and righteous in, uh, in my Lord Jesus Christ. Make sense? That's the end, then, uh, of uh, this collection of parables. Now, glory of glories, we get to go into the parables of judgment. Uh, to conclude uh, the third section. So that's what we'll be doing uh, next, uh, next time. Let's close with prayer. Enlighten the darkness of our hearts, O Lord, by the word and sacrament which we shall receive. Make us to rejoice not in the things of this world, but entirely in your Son, even Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.